Yeah. My favorite. It's Judd's Hockey Show. And indeed he do. It is Judd's Hockey <laughs> Show. Not a lot to get to. It's pretty much. Indeed he do. Indeed he do, Declan. I think I saw a... Uh, I think I saw a tweet yesterday that we are six weeks to training camp. So wow, the the wheels are slowly in motion for us to get to a point where there's going to be a lot more to talk about. But uh, that is not today. Nonetheless, we do want to uh, dive into the Matt Dumba conversation. Finally signing with the Coyotes. But before we do that, Declan, I want to talk about I want to talk about water, not ice, water. And say this: attention, all power sports enthusiasts. Our friends from Power Lodge and Miller Marine have an exciting announcement. This August, we invite you to celebrate with Power Lodge as they hit a major milestone. Look at that on the water. Just gorgeous days. 25 years of bringing action and excitement to Minnesota as your go-to destination for all things marine and sports. To say thank you, each of their locations will host a local community appreciation day. Join Power Lodge in Brainerd, Ramsey, Onamia, or Sock Rapids as they roll out the red carpet with delicious food, prizes, fantastic giveaways, and unbeatable special pricing. Uh, pricing as the grand prizes. They'll be raffling off a variety of Polaris ATVs and snowmobiles. Check out PowerLodge.com for the event dates nearest you. And this Saturday, in other words, Saturday, uh, we're recording this on Friday, so tomorrow, join Hubbard and Ramsey at Power Lodge from noon to 2 p.m. with nice. Score North and Tom Bernard Swag. Plus, someone who registers to win on Saturday will score a pair of Gopher Corn Husker. That's right, Gopher ba, Nebraska. Home opener tickets, Declan. Ba, 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 831, ba, ba, August 31st is that game. Lower level seats on the 50 yard line. So mark your calendar as um, we celebrate all things throttle therapy, Power Lodge, and Miller Marine. All right, let's get to the topic at hand. Uh, Matt Dumba who was on the free agent market for seemingly forever uh, as we waited for something to get done. And I I had heard scuttlebutt that he was actually going to, he had an offer from Arizona for a long time, but was actually going to sign with the San Jose Sharks after Eric Carlson got traded to Pittsburgh. Mm. And um, sure enough, that trade goes down and Matt Dumba signs, but he signs a one year $3.9 million contract with the Coyotes. So he signed with the team that from which he had the original offer, very Mm -hmm. short term, 3.9 3.9 is not bad, but it's certainly not great. Certainly not in today's National Hockey League. It's not breaking the bank. So after 10 years, what's your take here with this one? Because I feel like there was a lot of internal wild and Minnesota sports angst about this. You know, oh, Dumba's going to leave, uh, man. You know, going back a year, we were blaming Dumba being here for ha- having to trade Fiala, which now is more is folly incorrect. than ever. No. So what's your take here on what I really see as of two very opposite viewpoints, which is one, our viewpoint, and two, what the rest of the National Hockey League thought? So I think with Minnesota fans, we, we just get so in love with guys that have been here for a long time, people that were heavily involved in the community. Um, and Matt Dumba was both those things. And top pick, what, the eighth overall draft pick in the 2012 draft. So like a high-regarded prospect, spent basically 10 years if or so, with the organization did a lot of good fans love him. He brings a lot of energy. I can see that, but to be honest, and we've been hinting at this, you know, for the last basically year and a half that we saw the writing on the wall, that this was going to be the end of Matt Dumba's chapter here. And to be honest, it's, it's okay. It's time. It's not like they're losing someone that's so core to their blue line. Brock Faber is going to step in, probably be as good, if not certainly better than Matt Dumba. Um, and his offensive production over the last few years has just kind of fallen off, fallen off a cliff Dumba that is. So I don't think that this is a death sentence that they now have to replace him. And Oh my God, they got to put in a guy who only played what 10 games with them and Brock favor. No, Brock favor is a better player. He's more cost effective. Um, this is not the end of the world. Thank you, Matt Dumba for your service, but now it's time to move on and, and turn a new leaf. Yeah. It's just, it, it's an intriguing conversation to me because, you know, there was all this talk about, again, going back a year, you know, well, you know, if you traded Dumba and, and made a couple of moves, you could have kept Fiala, which clearly you couldn't have. Like, th- like they were never related, but it became even more clear now um, exactly how unrelated those two things were. Matt Dumba was a, a nice player. Uh, I'm a little bit surprised there hasn't been more attention paid to this, though. So there is no question. If you recall, Dex, 
the start or not just the start it was actually extended period of time how great Dumble looked before the fight against Kachuk at the X, which derailed his season. It ended it and derailed his career. In my opinion, he was never the same player. The shot, he still had the shot, but he couldn't control it as much. Go, go back to that, that year. I mean, offensively, he was moving into that upper echelon that we, you know, often talk about. And the one that got away to a certain degree, Brett Burns, right? I mean, and Brent Burns, not a great defensive defenseman, but, you know, Brent Burns went on to just have an unbelievable offensive defenseman type of career. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to you at the time about this on and off the mic about, oh, my God, Dumba's like, because there was a frustration with Matt, I think, until right around that time. And then he got he got good, if that makes sense. And then he got in that fight, hurt the shoulder, and it was never the same. But I really thought that that one event changed the trajectory of a guy who we thought might get, for if, if that had continued, Norris Trophy votes, to mm-hmm. a guy who was like, oh, boy, this is this is not the same guy. Yeah, I mean, if you just look at his career rates, um, so he averages a goal 0.13% of the time in his career. So that, that's good for about eight to nine goals, basically a season. And during that year in 2018-19, in those 32 games he played, it was 0.38. So it was triple the amount. Like He was scoring triple the amount that he has in his entire career. And yes, it was early in the season. I mean, we were wondering, is this guy going to hit 25 goals as a defenseman? I mean, he had 14 goals, um, excuse me, 12 goals in 32 games yeah. that season. 12 goals in 32 games. So we were wondering, is this going to be a 20-goal scoring defenseman? I mean, at the time, yes, that's a very rare player. Carlson, Burns. Um, and that was basically it. And he was going to enter that echelon of a, of a player. Um, and yeah, the, I still think he turned into a pretty solid defenseman. And, and to be honest, the bookends of those seasons, we saw pretty much very similar Matt Dumba's outside of the anomaly before the Kachuk injury. But um, yes, he was, I would say he was never the same after that fight and, and the shoulder, you saw that. You just, you, it, it was his shoulder, man. I mean, it was all, all that power comes from that slap shot and right. it just never was the yes. same. He still brought energy, still brought a lot of good things, but he was yep. never going to reach the peak that we saw in that little tease of the season. Yeah. I, I thought that there was a prolonged period. And again, to your point, not surprising. There was a long period of time after he got hurt where he just didn't want to shoot as much or at times at all, which is like, oh my God, that's too bad. And then I felt like the past year or so he did shoot more, but and I, this is purely observational, but it seemed to me that he didn't know where the shot was going. Like how many times in the last year plus or two, two years did we see him take that shot and it would miss the net? And I felt like there was a period of time before that fight against Kuchuk, which again, if you go back, was a stupid fight because he had put on uh, a hit against a Calgary player in Calgary a couple weeks before that that was questionable. But this whole payback thing, and and for those who say nobody gets hurt in a in a hockey fight, go back and watch that because a guy did get hurt. But it, it was not knowing where the shot was necessarily going. But you, we, I agree with what you just said too, which is I ultimately think, and this is where the Fiala trade, I think if you track this trade, Dex, I think it's shaping up to be on both ends one of the best trades, and it started with Paul Fenton. So I am really, I am tortured by saying this because he obviously did not work out and was a problem. But if you look at the Fiala trade with Nashville, and you now trace that back to Faber and the prospect that they've got. That Fiala trade not only was a fantastic trade as far as the upgrade on the acquisition that you got with Kevin from the Predators, but it also could be ultimately a great trade for both teams um, because I'm with you. I think Faber, and it's early, I get that, but I think Faber's style and with the way that, that he plays is ultimately going to be a definite upgrade on what Dumba brought for the most part, not to say that Dumba was a bad player. I just think Brock Faber is a better player. And the Fiala trade, actually, it's a weird one because it's going to benefit you potentially with him coming here and then him going to the Kings. Well, trace it back to where it starts with Mikhail Granlin. So Granlin turns into Fiala. Fiala turns into Faber and plus a prospect. So basically, Mikhail Granlin turned into a, a upper echelon goal scorer in Kevin Fiala. 
And then you also got yeah. a really stay at home defenseman and Brock Faber plus a prospect. We'll see what happens with the prospect. But regardless, you took a you took a winger who clearly had peaked in Mikhail Granlin, and he still bounced around a little bit. Now what? He's in he was in Pittsburgh. He just signed somewhere. I forget where I saw Sharks. him go. Sharks. No, he got just traded. San Jose now. He's, he's part, part of the, the trade. Carlson he's part of the trade. Carlson trade. Yeah, and his career is make no mistake about it washing out the Pittsburgh thing was a disaster they couldn't stand him in Pittsburgh like he didn't that was a terrible trade for the Penguins right so you basically took a guy who had clearly peaked already from the season Mm -hmm. before and was still a good player he was still a top six forward and you turned that into a younger upper echelon goal scorer that was better than him and then you turn it into a legitimate prospect and I know there was some there's still some people out there that they still they still sold too low on Fiala um I think everyone knew that the wow were going to trade him too so it wasn't just it yes could uh, on the surface, could you have probably gotten more for a goal scorer of Kevin Fiala's nature? Yes, but everyone knew you were, weren't going to sign him. So it, it it created this pickle basically for Bill Guerin knowing crap. All right, so I'm going to have to hedge a little bit, but what can I still get? And you got Brock Faber, a good player, and you got what? I think a second, was it a second round pick? You got, a, you got another decent draft pick in that hall as well. So you took Mikhail Granlin, got Kevin Fiala, and then Brock Faber, plus a legitimate prospect. I think that's a pretty good deal when you all when you all uh, look back on it too. It definitely is, and I I do think if this works out the way that it should, mm-hmm. I I think ultimately the Wild is going to be in a better position with their top four d- defensemen. I'm very curious to see who Faber plays with. I'm guessing it's Brodine, um, but that's going to be an intriguing one because you know if. Brodine is so damn solid that the only thing there is whoever plays with him. And I don't want to imply that they should be dumb with how they play. Right. But whoever plays with Brodine can most definitely take some chances because Brodine, I mean, how many times, in fact, there, there was a stretch. If if I'm not mistaken, Dumbo was playing so poorly at one point last season that he was a healthy scratch a few times, Mm -hmm. but there was a point where, um, where we were talking on the show about the fact that it was clear when Dumbo was struggling that Brodine was basically playing one and a half positions on defense because he would come over and just cover for him. Yeah. And, and you know, Brodine, okay, one is, I will say this, the Wilds' lack of playoff success hurts everybody. So anybody who we see as being good in the regular season hasn't necessarily carried it into the playoffs, but in so talking about the regular season here, Brodine is one of the most solid defensemen around. And so I'm curious to see how Dean stacks this up because I don't expect him for sure to break up the, the top pair, which is going to continue to be Spurgeon and Jake Middleton. But do you mm-hmm. then put Faber with, um, do you put uh, Brock with Brodine? Do you put a younger guy who's got some offensive skill with Brodine? Like there's, there's some ability here now to... Um, to make some adjustments. Cause I do think that Faber is going to end up being just another really reliable, solid hope, you know, probably taken for granted a bit, which is too bad, but not by his team defenseman. So I would be pretty shocked if they don't put Faber with Brodeen, um, unless there's some other weird move that, that sneaks in here, which I don't think I, I, I don't see happening. Um, sure. <clears throat> your third pairing is probably going to be a combination of, Merrill, Goligoski, Addison, other slappy who maybe impresses um, in training camp and, and takes a roster spot. But the top four of those guys, obviously Spurgeon, Middleton, Brodeen, Faber, um, that's still as good as any top four in the NHL. And I know Brock Faber's only played like 12 games in the NHL, but I still think that's as good of a top four as you can possibly have basically in the, in the NHL. And the Wild have had really good blue lines, but to our point, has those blue lines lived up to playoff hockey? And I think we finally have answered that question or at least teetered on the no side. We can't say it's completely black and white that it's a for sure no, but there's right. enough sample size to suggest that those guys get pushed around and play off hockey. So I don't really know. Maybe maybe Faber is, you know, the missing ingredient that kind of turns that whole blue line around, right? I mean, Faber's a bigger guy. Um, I don't know if he's going to be as, I, w- I don't want to use the word reckless, but I don't know if he's going to be as active as Matt Dumba in terms of laying the hits and, being active on the ice, but maybe he is the missing ingredient that kind of turns that blue line into a really good regular season blue line, but maybe he's the missing punch in the playoffs that have that, that, that position has basically lacked. 
Yeah, that's fair. That's a possibility. I I think the thing is that that when it comes to like the hits, mm -hmm. um, Dumba was willing to play a physical brand that that I liked. I'd be curious to go back now and see also though. How, how many times did those hits leave him susceptible and out, out of position a little bit too? Because I, I think the one I think Brodeen and Faber as a pairing, I think, will be incredibly solid, reliable, smart, not risky though. And so I am curious. In a perfect world, you know, Spurgeon provides some offense. Obviously, Middleton really doesn't for the most part. But I am curious where that's going to come from and and then to your point about the third pairing you know i'm also incredibly curious about that one now kalen addison still is not signed yet he's gonna sign i, I think he just has to at some point in time i think it's uh i think unfortunately because he has no power contractually it's just a uh, formality but the other one too dex is third pairing you know we keep talking about kalen playing and yeah i get that but until i see dean invest in kalen I'm not convinced of anything there. Like, yeah. I, you know, I mean, the guy was running the power at play last year, and you went out and got John Klingberg, who, by the way, got more from Toronto than Dumba did from the Coyotes, which is surprising because I was, you know, I was, it's not, Klingberg did some things I liked, but he did a lot of things I didn't like. But until Kalen Addison, until we see him on the ice consistently, and he's not all of a sudden being scratched and gained 30 through 35 to teach him a, a lesson. I'm not going to be convinced that Dean has embraced him yet. So that third pairing could be a lot of different things. And I think on the topic of Goligoski, the question is this, how many games do they trust him to play? Yeah. I mean, he was a spectator for a huge portion and, and, you know, he got into that game. He finally uh, got a chance to play again against the senators. He actually scored. He, he was out there in three on three, which I think amazed us all and scored the winning goal in that game. Yeah, But, yeah, the Kalen Addison thing, I will only become convinced that he is going to be a primary part of this team when he doesn't end up being scratched for games at a time. Yeah, I, I don't know really what their long-term plan is. I, I still wonder if he's trade bait before the start of the season. You know, I, I just I don't think, um, unless he has impressed them enough and maybe training camp is really the the barometer there that if he comes in and he's, there's a new work ethic and there's a new style to his game and a new appreciation that Dean and the coaching staff really, really like. Um, Cause it seems like both Dean and bill are kind of working hand in hand in that one I th or not hand in hand. They had the same outlook on Kalen Addison so far. You no, know, um, bill was probably a lot more higher on him. Cause he was one that was that acquired him in the, yeah. what Jason Zucker trade with, and with uh, Galchenyuk and, and knew him really well. Yeah. But clearly his, I, and I think it's more of off the ice than it is on the ice that has kind of percolated up with Bill, which is something that he really knows a lot about. And I think we sometimes take for granted that, well, he's a highly regarded prospect. You need to play him regardless. Well, if he's also not living up to expectations, not on the ice, but also off the ice, that is an issue. And for good or for, for better or worse in hockey, that matters. Um, so to them, that has been a problem. So if something happens, I think in training camp that changes their minds, then yeah, he's probably in the lineup most games this season. Uh, but for right now, I think he still has to prove it. And it's probably, he might have the most to prove at training camp when it opens here in six weeks, he might have the absolute most. And my question off that point is this one though. Okay. So look, you know, let's say he goes through camp has a, a good camp. He certainly has abilities. I mean, he's a smaller guy, but I mean, he can, he, he can move the puck. Mm -hmm. And they probably need guys that can overall from the blue line move the puck a, a bit, especially on the power play, because that's why he was he he was in the doghouse while anchoring the first power play, which speaks volumes to what they thought of the ability of guys on the blue line to do that. But I guess what I want to see is if Kalen Addison has a good camp and is playing consistently and he screws up in game 15. Is he in the press box in game 16? Because that's the right. Dean thing, right? That's the Dean thing. I can't trust you. You're out. And I think in retrospect, when you go trade for Klingberg, who, yes, has a has a name, and he did some things pretty well on the, the power play. His, his ability to navigate the blue line, right, and get that, that sort of floating shot off was really nice. But when you made that move, you basically gave Kalen Addison a vote of no confidence. And so 
I agree with you. I think he's got a ton to prove in training camp, but I also think that there's going to be a question of until Dean sees him make a mistake and says, all right, kid, go back out there. <laughs> Cause that's the Dean thing to me. That's the Dean thing. There's not a lot of, there's not a lot of tolerance for that end of, okay, you screwed up, but you know what? I'm still going to trust you. So that's my big one with not just Kalen, but you know, but Marco Rossi, mm -hmm. like when he screws up, is he going to be gi given the grace of, you know what? We got to keep trying this or, Hey dude, you're on the fourth line and go, go sit by Judd and Dex in the press box. So that's my biggest thing with Dean too, is what's, what's the mission for 2023, 24? Like what is, is, is this just run it back again, have as good of regular season as possible, get to the playoffs and pull the same old, or are you actually going to put a premium on developing players? And until the wild does that, until this administration does that, I'm going to stick with, they're going to try and get as many points as possible. Unfortunately, that is never, you know, we, we now have two very different teams, Declan, in the past two years, very different teams, makeups, different styles, different. Um, and both have f fallen into the same thing, which start a playoff, a first round series off really well, and then go in the tank. So, that's my, that's my big thing to watch is what's the approach. Hey, before we get done, mm -hmm. answer me this. And I might, this could be dug up by old takes exposed in eight months, but answer me this one. Are you with me on what are the Penguins doing? Sidney yeah, Crosby, I, I, who look, I mean, Sidney Crosby, do, and I know they're trying to win one more time with Sid and Malkin, okay? But Eric Carlson who was absolutely great, Norris Trophy, has no commitment to playing defense at all. Are you telling me that you're going to have – it's basically like this one, this last run, this this last dance, but I don't think they got a shot. Well, this is – this is vintage Kyle Dubas. I, I like this is what he did in Toronto. Like he he looks for shots in the arm, and I think he's a very smart guy. Don't get me wrong; I think he's a very smart dude. But this is also a vintage like Toronto trade, right? Like look at all the moves Toronto has made in the last few years. Sometimes with with just these last minute shot in the arm type of things, and it's the core. And he wants to make a splash, and you know Carlson, I guess to them is that splash move. I don't. Yeah, I I, I don't think the Penguins are anything special. Um, they don't scare me. The East is loaded too, by the way. It's still loaded. So, yeah, not – I don't think it's going to work. And it's an interesting move that they want to try to do, but I'm not surprised someone of, of that GM stature comes in here and wants to make a big splash, and that's his first big one post-Toronto, right? So I'm not, I'm not too surprised by it. If he's playing chess and not checkers, the real smart move would, would be to know that this is going to blow up, mm -hmm. that you're going to miss the playoffs. It's going to look like you're trying hard and get you a high draft pick. That would be the genius thing. But beyond that, it's like, oh, my God, are you serious, dude? And, yeah, Dubas likes to to make splashes, but I'm sorry. I just I, – I think getting an aging defenseman who had a great year after a few disappointing ones and putting him with an aging team, but perhaps he knows en enough to know it won't work and he's an absolute genius. All right, we are uh, done here. Dex, tell the people what they need to know. Hit the subscribe button for daily Minnesota sports entertainment right here on the score North YouTube channel. We got twin show stuff. We got plenty of flagrant howls content, even though it's Good the show. off season for the wild and the twin wild and the wolves, plenty of stuff. We got Royce unchained also on this YouTube channel, heading over to purple daily too, with some preseason takeaways. So got you covered for a three man band here. WWE reference there that I think only a few people will get and pass shoot score. Yeah.